good, good. Well, David, would you like to start with your reading? Uh, and then I will start our, our session. Well, yes, I would very much like to do that. And let's do a little bit of Walt Whitman today. Okay. <clears throat> when I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were arranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and the diagrams to add, divide and measure them. When I sitting heard the astronomer, where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, I was soon unaccountable, I became tired and sick. Till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Thank you. It's it's excellent. Walt Whitman is one of uh, my favorites as well. Thank you, Rabbi Mary. Welcome. <laughs> We've been missing you. I hope all has been okay. Good, good. Well, and I see Masha is trying to connect with us. Oh no, it, it, it's Wendy, and Masha bumped over. Okay. <laughs> Well, I wanted to welcome everyone, and I'm going to read our uh, someone has an echo effect. That was Wendy's phone. Okay, you, you solved it. Okay, uh, I'll read our uh, opening prayer in Hebrew today. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher kedeshanu b'mitzvosav Bitsivano la Hadlik Bitsivano la Sok Divre Torah. Thank you. I was relighting our candles. <laughs> anyway, I uh, want to welcome everyone. And uh, uh, the rabbi will, uh, Rabbi Norman, will not be with us today. Uh, he has something that just came up that he has to take care of. So just wanted to let you know. Uh, I th uh, going back to uh, Exodus, I think we finished, uh, did we fin finish for uh, chapter seven? No, we're starting, no, on, no. No, we're starting chapter seven. No, we were at, I actually made a check mark, Marty. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we were at verse 24. Verse 24. So yep. we're at Exodus 7, verse 24. That's, that's where my check mark was. So that's, I'm going by your check mark. Uh, was I not here last week? Okay. Well, it's possible. It's, it's possible. Is it my check mark having 7 1? Okay. Yeah, that you, you must have missed last week. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, if uh, somebody would like to begin. Uh, uh, reading, uh, is, did we finish verse 24? Gail, did we finish? We No, we didn't. Okay, and so if somebody would like to uh, read verse 24. And Just all 24. the Egyptians had to think about, about in the Nile uh, or drinking water because they could not drink the water of the Nile. Thank you. Well, this is in response to uh, turning the waters of the Nile to blood. Okay. And, uh, and so it is, uh, any comments last, from last week that anybody would like to make about the waters of the Nile turning to blood? We discussed a little bit about, uh, about the, uh, uh, the death of the, uh, uh, firstborn of the uh, Jewish children. Uh, some people have commented about this in response to it. Uh, any other comments? Yes, Don. Um, I'm going to revisit a question I had, which I promised I would never bring up again, but I was been researching this all week. Um, and it has to do with Pharaoh's free choice in denying the Hebrews the opportunity to go and worship. And God had said he'd harden his heart. 
So I thought, well, I'm not smart enough to be the only one who ever had a question about that. So I started digging around. It turns out it's, it's a really huge theological issue that the Midrash and tons of commentary by the rabbis and by Christian theologians as well, because um, it, it's such a pivot point as to what happens afterwards that God forces Pharaoh to bring on the plague in, in Ephraim. So, so I started to drill down and there, there were no really satisfying answers I could come up with. Um, the, the, the Midrash just basically said, well, God can do whatever he wants to do. Because <laughs> he's God and left to the ground. Um, which is, you know, a response. And uh, then I go a little further. I'm not going to go too deep in this because I'll, I'll end up monopolizing the discussion. But um, I started wondering about the, the Hebrews as slaves in, the, in Egypt at that time. And so I remember when um, when Joseph was chief operating officer for Pharaoh, that all the Hebrews traded the land that they had for grain. So they no longer were landholders and they were effectively indentured servants. And so that, according to scripture, that descended into slavery at this time. But then at that time, at the time we're looking at it right now, the Egyptians did not have a monetary system. There was no such thing as money really. And so Everybody who wasn't loyalty was a slave. It, it was a ration system. You worked and you got paid with rations. And so there were lots of other people besides Hebrews working there. Uh, and the work was definitely like slavery. I mean, it was just like serfdom from the Middle Ages. But I'm going to stop here because otherwise I'll get... Okay. We are going to address this uh, a little later on because, uh, and I was going to ask you uh, to restate your opinion uh, at that point because there is a little shift in the writing. Okay. Uh, up to now, uh, we can enter into a debate like we have, or like we have had in the past. But in, in, as we get on in the reading of the plagues, there is a line that's even more questionable. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I would like to hold that aside for now. But it's, a, it's still a very important question. And to this day, I don't think anyone has a great explanation. Okay, we, uh, you, can, uh, you can take it in multiple directions. There are multiple midrash on, uh, on this. Um, and so the more you read, I think the more confused you're going to get <laughs> because there are so many uh, different points of view. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, any any for any further comments about uh, the water of the Nile being turned to blood? Yes, uh, uh, please, Pastor Bruce. Yeah, I'm going to have to go shortly, as you know. Oh, okay. But, um, I I just always think about this as Egypt's life was in the Nile. Yes. Maybe you already said this last week and because I wasn't here. So you, you probably already said it. But it's okay that, to repeat it. Because to it's okay to repeat um, it. But, okay. but Egypt's lifeblood, life came from the waters of the Nile. And so often in, in the totality of scripture, when you have blood, it can, it can signify death or it can signify life. And I think that as you look at this, um, that in this case, it's that kind of would signify death when it comes to Egypt, but life for Jewish people. 
Now that's I don't know. I don't know if you've ever. I don't know what was said last week, so I could be repeating what somebody else said. But anyway. <laughs> okay, but I that's think what that's I was interesting. Anyway, Any comments? Any comments? Gail, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just thinking how blood plays a a, a part in Jewish tradition. Um, with koshering the food. Yes. Uh, slaughter the animals on the altar, the blood with that. Well, it's kind of, I don't know if that's important, but it struck me because he was talking about tradition and how there's this theme. And somehow in the Jewish tradition, there is blood is kind of not good, I guess. And that, you know, and using it or in ingesting it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Any other comments? Rabbi Miri, did you have a comment? No, I think that I adhere to Gail and uh, Pastor Bruce. The issue of life and death connected with blood is very stronger, is very strong, and the issue of water as life is very strong. We say, Maim Chaim, which is. Um, living water. Later on, uh, the rabbis say that uh, water is Torah. And it's, it, it, as Gail say, both of them are very prominent symbols in our tradition. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Very good question, uh, Pastor Bruce. Uh, I, and Gail and Rabbi Mary, that, that was really a good discussion. We're going to well, miss Pastor Bruce. He had to leave. Yes, did somebody else he, have a comment? The blood could be uh, uh, the blood could be uh, looked at two ways. If what they said, maybe I didn't understand, but as I could see it, the blood represents the life and death. In this case, the blood was re representing. Uh, the blood of the Jews that God is saving and spilling the blood of Israel's enemies, which would be the Egyptians. Okay, good point. Good point. Yes, Don. And, and, and Helene. Don, can I let Helene go first because she usually has to leave early? Uh, Helene, yes. What came to my mind? was circumcision. Yes. What? Am I wrong? No, it is. Obsession? You say obsession? No, circumcision. Circumcision. Oh, oh, oh. A drop Circum of blood. Yeah. Blood. So it is, it is certainly a, an image over and over of life. It's a little interesting, Don. You, you, I think that's a very important uh, comment. Uh, but in when we, when the priests were uh, sprinkling the blood of the animal on the on the altar, it's part of the sacrifice. Maybe it's meant for uh, God, but not for man. In the koshering. I don't, you know, giving it back, giving it back to to God, as symbolic as giving the life of the animal back to God, and uh, as opposed to uh, just a symbol of death, uh, but symbol of life returning to God, the the uh, the spirit of the animal, if you will. So I don't know. I, I don't know the right answer. I, I, this is something I, uh, I, uh, it's, it's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> Don, do you want to say something? Don, you ha you've had your hand up. Yes. Uh, so the, uh, it's clear it's the rivers of the Nile. And uh, the Nile is very seasonal floods in the spring and so for the crops and then in the winter it dries up mm -hmm. um, and it's it starts it flows northward 
and it starts in Ethiopia up in the mountains. Uh, and so it gathers the rain fall in Ethiopia and then it all flows down. So somewhere the, the, the river must have turned to blood somewhere along that way, perhaps all, you know, thousand miles south in Ethiopia. We'll, we'll never know that. But it's just interesting that where the Nile turns to blood, at what point um, the, uh, the Hebrews were slaves around the Delta all the way to the north, um, which is all agricultural land. And uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, it's something we'll never know, but it's just interesting that there's a thousand miles where the river would have turned to blood. It's true. It's true. Uh, the Brit that you can the British were very uh, uh, taken with the Nile River because they wanted to explore the headwaters of the Nile, and uh, uh, they were uh, successful at reaching a body of water which is called Lake Victoria. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the in the midst of uh, of the jungles of, and the surrounding countries that exist today, and uh, so I just wanted to mention all of that. Uh, please, um, uh, Chris. You... Hi, Chris. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, and I'm sorry I was a little late. Um, good Shabbos to everyone. Just re uh, kind of responding to Don's question, which I. I, it puzzles me too, but I, it just came to my heart to say, whatever is impossible to men, it's never impossible to God. So maybe if he covered from Lake Victoria all the way to the end of the Nile, that was something that he could do. Not something that nature will ever be able to, to do unless God intervenes. That was my point. Uh, uh, yes, Rabbi Mary. Okay, um, I'm going to take uh, a couple of uh, couple of ways of looking at blood in our tradition. Now, uh, one that came to my mind is that we said the one that uh, pours, the one that does blood on a person, the blood will be on himself. Meaning, if you kill someone, you're going to be killed. So the first, so so dam is um, a blood that symbolizes life, as we said before. Now, the other point that I want to bring up, if you remember the last plague, do you? Anyone? You mean, the, that yes, the, 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 the marking the, the doorways with, with uh, sheep, uh, sheep blood. Right, so yes. marking the doorways with blood. Right. Again, we're talking life and death. Now, blood is, a, in, in um, at those days, what they figure out was, what, how do you know that someone is dead? So uh, someone is dead if all his blood was poured out. And then they, you know, is there air in uh, that? So that's, that's really a very strong point of, um, of death. Now, another one, Blood is poisonous, and Gail will tell you when we don't want to touch blood or people with blood. Who are the people that we avoid touching when they have blood? 50% of the population. Oh, the, oh <laughs> menses, okay, okay. Menstruating is a way of avoiding blood because it's seen as something that is sinful that it's being rejected and then it goes to the blood of the chicken that you have to salt so the blood goes away so blood has a lot a lot of metaphorical ways of holding it's not just you know blood now i'm going in another one point the word dam, mm -hmm. and you know, not dam, D U M B, but dam, blood, 
uh, now how do we say human? You, you mean human? Adam. 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 Right. Adam. Of the Adam, the first man, is and soil is called Adama. So here we have the uh, thread of blood into human into land. They are all and the red and the, and the word Adam, which is red. So we have a lot of things that the dam is involved in. And I would call, uh, how do we call the, the, the sea in a lot? Yam Edom. Or we say uh, the Red Sea, the red sea. which is the reflections of the mountains, blah, blah, blah. And then there is a people called Edom, the Edomites. Edom. So you see that this is a very powerful word and connections, and I'm sorry I talk so much, but I'm done. I appreciate what you said. You added a lot to the discussion, a, a tremendous amount. Any other comments about yeah, that? Um, yeah, Marty, there's an expression that's fairly, uh, well, uh, that 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 uh, people say when something goes wrong, you have blood on your hands, you know. Yep. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that That's usually, right. you know, that usually uh, responds to someone who kills or murders. Yes. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Murders another one. You have blood on your hands. Yes. I, I just wanted to say one thing about blood. Okay, you see it with other types of liquids, but blood, when it's placed on the ground, the liquid part is absorbed by the surrounding soil or sand or whatever. You don't see that with a, a you don't see that on a, a, a tile floor or linoleum, uh, uh, but anything that's porous, porous, porous will have the liquid part, the serum of the blood seep back into the soil. And so I, I would assume that these people weren't just making this up. They, it is a, visu a true visual uh, 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 experience when anyone sees that type of event. And, uh, and maybe that's where this comes from. How difficult is to remove a stain of blood? If you want to remove you a have stain to wash of blood, it. Yes. Yes, but the, it can be it can be brought to the surface. It's, this is quite remarkable. In crime scenes, blood cannot completely be washed away because uh, uh, science has developed a product called luminol, which will bring blood out of somebody tried to wipe it away or wash it away. It could be still detected. Yeah. Thank you. It, yes, Don, and and then Larry, and uh, and then. Uh, Ricky, yes, Don, and then and then David. I don't want to emphasize. I, I it's my fault that this is going on. But I but uh, go ahead, Don, please. I really appreciate this extent of the discussion, but I'm wondering how much we should get into the nuances and metaphors and linguistics because this is very physical, direct. You know, these are harsh punishments which are escalated yes. by God, and they lead to the escape of the Hebrews into the desert, and we, you know, could go off and draw all kinds of tangents on the meanings of the words, the, how what they mean metaphorically, but I'm wondering if we're going to, you know, miss the for the trip. No, we're not. Uh, we're not. I, we will come back. We will come back to this. I understand where you're coming from. Yes, Larry. I just wanted to mention we use the expression blood relative. Yes. And you know, that's significant. Kinship. Yes. Right. Ricky. Yeah, when uh, you're talking about blood being absorbed, I was immediately thinking about Kashmir. That you can't, you know, can't use a dish 
Well, because they were ceramic at that time, which would have right. absorbed glass, you can because it doesn't absorb. So that's what the blood and the absorption. That, made me think very of. good. Very good. Uh, David. It's actually Wendy. <laughs> oh, it's a Wendy hand. Okay. It, it's me. Um, you know, we're sort of comparing blood to somebody who's done something wrong. And like Michael said, you cannot wash it away. But Having done laundry with blood stains on shirts and things, there's something, <laughs> it sounds pretty gross, but if you treat the blood first with your own saliva, it does take the blood stain out. So maybe that's an analogy of only a human can forgive another human because ah. you're still wor wor working with the liquids in the body. There you go. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, on a on, not to make any humor of this, but Lady Macbeth had the final word on this. Out, 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 out damn yeah. spot. <laughs> so, oh my goodness, here we go. I, I was trying to end it. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ricky, and then Michael. Well, to, to pick up on Wendy's point, I've always felt that. You know, we kiss the bear, the child's boo-boo, you know, when they get wounded. And I've always felt that it's because our saliva, we spit on it, we, you know, mm. you know, on the wound. Our saliva has so much, so many healing properties that we don't accept. You know, so um, yes, I didn't know that saliva would wash out blood stains, but I do know that they make they make the wound better when you you lick on it. Thank you. Okay, Michael, you're going to have the final word on the blood. Okay, I say this only as a point of interest. When any president of the United States travels abroad, uh, the Secret Service makes sure that there's a supply of blood mm -hmm. available, uh, God forbid, just in case. That's true. That's very true. Well, I think we have uh, we have run this into the ground, so to speak. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, so uh, why why don't we uh, begin speaking now with verse twenty five and see where it takes us? Are we uh, uh, are we starting oh. at twenty four or twenty five? Did we twenty five last week? 25, verse 25, okay. Exodus 7, verse 25. Okay. And Moses said, when I leave far, plead Wait them to me. Exodus 7. Okay, sorry. Exodus, Exodus 7. Oh, I ended up on Exodus 8, sorry. It's I okay. Know. There it is. Um, when seven days had passed after the Lord struck the Nile, the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may worship me. Okay, Let, let's them. stop at that point. Because, uh, any comments about the phrasing or, or the, or of what we just read? Well, we go back to the thus saith the Lord, which we talked about a few weeks ago. Okay. Uh, okay. Why do you bring that up? Well, I was just remember we had a conversation about that a while back. Um, what did Pharaoh yeah. say to tell, you know, when he's commanding everyone from his, uh, what to do to the Jewish people? It says, thus saith Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And so this is, thus saith the Lord. Okay, I can do things, and uh, so it, that's why it becomes a very uh, important commentary on what the Pharaoh has said. Oh, okay, is that okay? That's one of the midrashes on that. Okay, Gail, I think you had your hand. I thought I saw somebody. Well, I was just, I was just going to make a note of, and, sure. seven, and seven days were filled after striking the Nile. I yes. think this is the only time that seven days or a particular time period is mentioned with the plagues, but I, I may be wrong, but 
it's you know seven is the big deal in our tradition so okay maybe maybe he needed a day of rest after doing that i don't <laughs> know <laughs> I, anyway um uh so any um any any other comments? The the uh, the the rest of the phrase not just uh, say it says the Lord, but uh, what what is the rest of the sentence? So Let that my people, people go that they may worship me. Right. Okay. So it, any comments about that? Yes, Chris. Chris, you're muted. I admire that the Lord has now removed his finger from the issue. Uh, that's what he wants, and that's what he's going to get. Um, so many times we as humans try to convince God that the other way is better. But finally, ultimately, God's will will be done. Good point. Very good point. I was going to mention this later. I'm currently reading a book by um, uh, uh, a, a Rabbi Laufer on the qualities of leadership, and uh, one of the uh, one of the strengths and one of the pitfalls in leadership is to to repeat what you have already done if it has worked in the past and thinking of pharaoh and and uh he, he in in his concept of leadership he's going to fall into this pattern and each time he gets closer and he will get closer and closer to full repentance but then he falls short of that and he falls back on, on in doing things in a bad way okay as opposed to seeing what he has done and it, maybe he would have only needed three or four or five plagues instead of the the ultimate tenth and and but leaders have a tendency to do that uh, they have, but they have to also learn what doesn't work. And that's what Rabbi Laufer, how, how Rabbi Laufer looks at this issue. Anyway, uh, so keep that in mind as we go through the other plagues as well. Uh, so uh, any other comments? Yes, yes, yes Don. Uh, that verse is really uh, at the crux of what's going to happen here because Moses is going to say for God says let my people go that they may serve me and at that point everybody was serving Pharaoh uh, and that's the point of departure because and, and for what I could determine the Pharaoh at that point Pharaoh Pepe who had only been Pharaoh for about three years into that dynasty so he was still, you know, still teething, so to speak. And now he's got a million people saying, no, we're not going to, we don't want to serve you anymore. We want to serve our God. So that verse is kind of really, well, all the verses are important, but that one in particular. So it becomes a very important part, and that's going to be repeated uh, also. It, it, it's a repetition already. Of what uh, what has uh, uh, so just keep in mind the number of times that phrase uh, turns up. Uh, somebody want to pick up with verse twenty seven? If you refuse to let them go, then I will plague your whole country with uh, frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs, and they shall come up and enter your palace, your bedchamber, and your bed the houses of your courtiers and your people and your ovens and your meeting bowls. The frog shall come up on you and on, on your people and on all your courtiers. Okay. Uh, some people have linked 
uh, the two plagues together, okay, because they deal with the Nile River. Uh, but uh, what else? Uh, any other comments about this? Yes, Larry. And then. Um, okay, this is according to a fox. Uh, mm -hmm. Frogs are a symbol of fertility in Egyptian culture. Yes. Um, and so the plague might be regarded as an assault on the Egyptian gods. Um, there also may be an ironic hint here of the swarming of the Is Israelites. Interesting. So it's a population. Okay. Yes, Don. He, out of all the possible things that could happen, a a uh, swarm of frogs is so you can't make this stuff up i mean it must have happened you know it, it really it really must have happened and so uh i mean you can't if you were asked to think up a plague to inflict on an entire kingdom you would not think of frogs so, <laughs> That's a good one. You're right. You know, yeah, it's good. interesting uh, because, uh, yes, the, uh, the, the, it, it, each one of the plagues, last time uh, we, we spoke about uh, the water turning to blood, and we spoke about the three gods of Egypt that, that this is in reference to. And with regard to the frogs, there are two... Um, uh, gods that are uh, associated. Uh, one is, uh, and no pun intended, but one is happy or uh, or hap or ha happy. It depends on how you pronounce it. But uh, was a frog goddess of Egypt, and yet. Heki was another god of fertility. Okay, so yes, all of these were uh, were part of this. And uh, it, it one of the things with the first plague and the second plague also occurs in the land of Goshen. It's throughout Egypt, but later on, it gets Goshen gets separated out. So the question, uh, Marty, yes, yes, uh, Rabbi Mary. One of the things about frogs is that it's one of the, shall I call it animal? Yeah. <laughs> is that it's forbidden to eat. It's a yes. sherit. Yes. It's sharat and it's sherit. So let's remember, and it's poisonous. It can be really poisonous. So we have here too, the issue of, not allowed and um, representing death if they are poisonous. Interesting point. Uh, there are some frogs that the uh, it's, it secretes the venom through its skin. And uh, it, uh, it, it can, in small doses, it can give people a high. In larger doses, it can, uh, it, it, so they can hallucinate, if you will. Uh, but in higher doses, it can actually paralyze them. Very much like in a, uh, the, the dart poison that the, uh, the uh, Aborigines uh, use, okay? So it, uh, it's, it's just uh, an interesting commentary. Uh, so any other, any other discussion? Well, let's go on in, in our reading. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, if, I guess we are now on Exodus 8, eight. verse eight. 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, hold out your arm with the rod over the rivers, the canals, and the ponds, and bring up the frogs on the land of Egypt. Aaron held out his arm over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same with their spells and brought frogs upon the land of Egypt. Okay. Now, 
does anyone know about fr when uh, the weather in Africa, you have a rainy season and you get f a little flooding from that, not just the Nile, uh, but if it's a rainy season, what happens here in good old Green Valley it, it, in summers when it's been very, when it's been full of rain? The frogs. Get, frogs. And they come start coming out and you hear them at night and everything. And they, they, the ones here can really bellow. Uh, so th it must have also been a huge racket with all the croaking going on. So, uh, and no pun intended, I didn't mean dying. I meant the croaking of the frogs. But it, <laughs> but it, uh, so it may be that it was just something that uh, was fortuitous, you know, because of the season. Now in Central Africa, the rain, you have a large rainy season and a small rainy season or a long and short rainy season. And uh, just like we have here, we have a, uh, a rainy season in, in the fall. And then in the summer, we also have a, uh, I mean, in, in around December, we have a shorter rainy season. So it's not an unusual event to occur. And uh, so I don't know if it was that time of the year when it was raining. But it gives well, you some I'm, thought. I also noticed that the uh, the magicians could do the same thing. So that's right. Something special. That's right. So maybe it was just the time happened to be the time of year. I don't know. Yes, Don. Yeah, the, the thing with the magicians is they they duplicated the the blood, body water as well. But at this point, I mean, the pharaoh must have just fired them because they. they Double the number of frogs that are crawling around the countryside. I mean, it's, it's absurd, you know. They, um, I, they had to be just inserting this, probably for storytelling. So, I mean, you wouldn't want, you got frogs crawling all over your kitchen. You wouldn't want twice as many kitchen. Yeah, they didn't, you know, well, if they had a frying pan, they could always have frogs' legs. <laughs> I, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> If this had happened in France, it would have been no problem. <laughs> Maybe. <we. laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> any other comments about the frogs? Well, let, let's go on and uh, uh, let's go on to verse uh, four. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to remove the frogs from me and my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, you may have this triumph over me, but what time shall I plead in behalf of you and your courtiers and your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses to remain only in the Nile? But tomorrow he replied, and Moses said, as you say, that you may know that there is none like the Lord our God. The frog shall retreat from you and your courtiers and your people, and they shall remain only in the Nile. Then any, Moses and any Aaron comments and any comments at this point? Yes, Chris. You have to unmute yourself. Yep, I was working on that. Good. Okay. I believe this is the first time I hear Pharaoh says. Talk to your God. Tell him change his mind. And, and I think that's beginning to work on his heart that there is a power greater than anything he's ever seen before that is alive and is working on this situation. And, and I love it that he begins to melt a little bit. But like you said, you know, he's going to go back to the habit of being feral, the stubborn feral, and continue. But I love that part where he says, okay, yeah. I, somebody else is out there that it is doing much greater than I would ever expect. Yeah. What you said also reminds me of something. And that is uh, atonement. 
Mm-hmm. Are these plagues a test for Pharaoh to atone? That's a good point. Very good point. Because in atoning, it's not just say saying you're sorry, right? And inch, and and saying, well, if this or I meant that, uh, it's it's just saying to I will not do it again. Yeah. And then do something. Early repentance. That's right. And he gets close each mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. But not he doesn't totally repent. No. And that may be part of this lesson series as well. That, uh, you know, yes, Rabbi Mary. Well, I'm with Chris. This is amazing, Chris, that as you said, that now the name, it's not just, it says the word Adonai. Mm-hmm. It yes. says, you hey, vav hey, which mm-hmm. is recognizing, as you said, that there is someone there. Uh, and the other word is, is behul, let them go and sacrifice. Before we had, let them go and worship. Oh. <laughs> so that's another piece that's a little um, questionable mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Uh, well done, please. Very good points. Very good points. Any other comment? Okay, then uh, uh, I guess we're uh, at verse 8. The yes, Chris. In Pharaoh's presence. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, Ricky. I think Chris had a oh, question. another yes. question. I, I, well, another comment that I have here was the fact that he's also having a conversation with Moses and with Aaron saying, uh, talk to your God about what's going on, but tell me the time. And he is setting up the time to have God to me do this miracle for him. That's like really, really touching base there for a little minute. And I think that's amazing that he's got that close at this point for it. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I omitted a commentary in Plout that uh, one of the things that he noted, that he notes, is that the magicians could increase but not decrease this nuisance of the frogs. Okay. So, it, in other words, they too, it, it, as I was saying, you get the frogs coming out of the water and, and out of the land and like that. But to get them away, that's a totally different story. And so it's another uh, a po- a very good point of, uh, to look at this, that God is uh, still doing a little bit more than what the courtiers can, courtiers can do. Okay, verse 8. Then Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh's presence, and Moses cried out to the Lord in the matter of the frogs, which he had inflicted upon Pharaoh. And the Lord did as Moses asked. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they piled them up in heaps till the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he became stubborn and would not heed them as the Lord had spoken. Okay, any comments about what we just read? He repented of saying God is good and God is greater than anything else. That's that. Yeah. Well, uh, what's interesting here is the word used in the Torah uh, about how Moshe talks now to uh, to God. Is is screaming, is yelling. Is the same word that uh, when we were slaves, we screamed and yelled to God, please help us. So it's not his talking. He says, uh, he's really already upset. I mean, Moshe gets upset very quickly. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Temper. yes, I would do the same, but yes. uh, here it does. Yeah. I love that comment. Um, Rabbi Miriam, because it is so important to really recognize that 
Moses is now growing so close to God and that what he has achieved with patience. Yes, he gets freaking anger, but uh, he has had patience to let himself grow closer to God because God yeah. has always been there, but we are not. Thank you. Thank you. Gail, did you have, I know Don had his hand up. Did you have it up before? Okay, Don, you're on. Again, we know what's going to happen here because God is it's predestined that Pharaoh is going to refuse and break in his word because he's being forced to harden his heart. So no matter, for, for each plague, we know he's going to say no. I mean, there's no suspense here at all. Um, so I don't know how Moses, maybe Moses' faith is being strengthened because Pharaoh keeps saying no, and he knows Pharaoh is going to say no, so he knows what he's going to do next. I don't know, but it's, it's no suspense here at all. Okay. Okay. Now, um, if we read 12, I think we did, right? We, we, stopped, we, we, we did. stopped at the end of 11. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, Don. Uh, any other comments? So, so Don raises the question: Is this preordained, or is it, does Pharaoh still have a choice? Any comments about that? Yes. Okay. Uh, Chris and Suzanne had, it's a tie. Let me, since Suzanne <laughs> has been very quiet, I'm going to call on Suzanne and then Chris again. Um, I, I, I still think there's a problem with this uh, translation of uh, for Harden, which is in our English versions. And God is so adamant about free will that we see in so many examples yes. throughout scripture. So to me, uh, this is, it's not preordained, although I, God knows the begin, <clears throat> the end from the beginning, uh, you know, I mean, he mm -hmm. knows that Pharaoh is going to say no. So I, I still, now I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Is this pre or is it? Is oh, it's preordained. No, I don't believe. No. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. Green Valley moment. That was what good. can I say? That was good. It's a Green Valley moment. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. Uh, I sort of think the same way this is not, but I do remember the question. <laughs> uh, Go ahead, rub it in. <laughs> no, sweetheart, you do it okay. Uh, I believe that God will continue to give us opportunities to see the reality of the situation, however long it takes, all the way to the point of death. Many times, he will let us see our own ways where are they taking us but i don't think that is saying you're going to do my will no matter what it's his desire is for us to to live according to the laws that he has said because there's life to us that's a, a, that's a, a way that we can survive this world but uh, the opportunities that he provides for us, I believe in my heart that they are so that we can see our walk and our nature and change on our own. But I don't think at any point he is pushing us or forcing us to follow his will. I didn't mean, we're free like Pharaoh. No, 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 no. Till the end, it's still no. And so that's, you know, that's where he's going to go. Okay. That was my point. Thank you. Thank you. Now Gail has her hand up. Okay. okay. I have a, I'm not sure we really want to go here, but I have to ask the question because this always has bugged me. The fact that the people of Egypt have to suffer for the Pharaoh's attitude, can I put it that way? Chris talks about choices and making decisions. These people had no say. 
And they're going to suffer from all these plagues because of poor judgment at the top. Now, this is history and the making, and we can talk about dictators and blah, blah, blah. Oh, it, no. always, it has always bothered me that so often the innocent have to suffer for the sins of... That is true. That is true. And those people I, had no choices, Chris. That's, you know, they couldn't repent. They couldn't do it. They had no control over this. I totally agree with you, Gail. I have never uh, been fan of the, the rulerships or politicians or anything that goes up there higher than us, where you are obligated to follow the law that they set. But to give a little likeness on this, I'd like to remember that these people at the end made a decision to follow the Hebrews because they saw the nature of God. So although they did suffer, which is normal, it's human. It's human. Suffering is humanity. That's what this world offers. But I remember that the scripture says, and I'm going way ahead of me, but just so that we can say this, um, the Hebrew, many of the Egyptians and other races attach themselves to the Hebrews when they exit um, Goshen, when they exit uh, Egypt. And I think that was the choice that they exercised. I'm no longer going to be under the power of any pharaohs, but under the mercy of God. That's all I can say. But I totally agree with you. But it's still going on even now. Oh, well, that's what I said. I mean, this yeah. is history. Right. But sure. the fact that you know God has control over this, and He's going to—he's not punishing Pharaoh. He's punishing everybody. Yes, this is. Uh, yeah. I, I'm going. I want that is an important co comment because right now, up till now, uh, the uh, Jew, the Israelites are suffering the same. The, the same punishments. So let, let me hear, Grace had an interesting uh, comment and I'd like her to expand on that. Grace? I don't have enough brain cells to expand on it. <laughs> well, well, you do, you said a well, lot there in just a I, few I, words. Well, I, I, good job us everyone and thank you. Sure. Um, all great comments and a lot has been said today and a lot of reading we've gotten we've had more progress in this day than i think we have since the beginning of uh, this year's torah study and um it i um i'm reflecting about you know we're gonna suffer and you I, I put that out there right before you made that comment that, you know, the Egyptians were the only ones that were right. you know, struck upon in the suffering in this ordeal. And in my mind and heart, God is putting these trials forth on all humankind, but is expecting the Hebrew to rise above it you know, and, and come out, you know, glorified or more strength. It's to give us strength to know that with God's help, we're going to get through anything that is brought before us. And that's what I'm feeling and seeing in this. But if we go back up, I just want to kind of go backwards a, a minute. Um, in chapter 8, verse 6. For tomorrow, he replied, and Moses said, as you say, that you may know that there is none like the Lord our God. None like. And that's a very powerful statement. Yes. You know, and I think we reflected upon that earlier. But, you know, and I, I, I really heard something powerful earlier. Um, I forget it was Mary agreed with someone. And I think it might've been Gail, but I could be wrong. I'm good at being wrong. Um, <laughs> that, you know, this is the first time she remembered, I think it was Chris maybe that she has seen where 
Moses or Moses says to Pharaoh or Pharaoh admits or Pharaoh is feeling like there's a force larger than he is. It's the first time that he is, he's recognizing that there's a force of something, someone, he doesn't know who it is yet, but you know, that can overtake him by his magic and his mystery or the mystery of our God. And that's kind of what I'm summing up, but um, thank you. I hope I expanded enough on it for you. You did. You did a good job. You did a very good job. I wanted to, uh, uh, you said something about, um, no, maybe I miss, I just had a Green Valley moment. So, so <laughs> I won't go there. Uh, uh, I, I, recommend, I recommend really, really, truly uh, that all of us uh, revise the plays because what was said here about the blood that affects everyone, uh, about the uh, frogs that affect anyone, uh, everyone, uh, because let's think for a moment, did the blood affect Pharaoh? No, he had bottled water. <laughs> he had clean water. He didn't suffer. He was close in his palace. He didn't suffer from the frogs. They were just outside, although it says that they were on the, on the beds and so forth, but not on his bed. He was clean and he had people that could clean them. So what we are thinking now and looking at that is how much personally he was affected by the plagues. Because when we come to plague number 10, things it's start It's more personal, changing. yes. Yeah. Until, until it affects you personally, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know what? It, it reminds me of the situation these days in which we have, what, 40% uh, of the people are not vaccinated. And in my mind, as soon as one of them, the grandmother, the mother, or themselves get sick, they'll go and vaccinate because it's a personal knowledge. It's right. personally when it's about a group, and this is expanding on what has been made now, the statement. How much do we care about the entire group, which is a very Jewish tradition to care about the community. But here we don't see that. Good point. The other thing is, I, I just remembered that you, you remember the people of uh, Egypt uh, had sold themselves also into slavery. Okay. Um, and, and gender. Yeah, and danger. Or in gender That's right. Or that they word. made themselves indentured servants. And, and and uh, and as so you have a group of slaves that had no choice, and you have people who are uh, servants, if you will, uh, who again have no choice, and that creates a, a mentality. These people have to be, and it and so maybe some of these plagues have to exist for everyone to realize that there's more to this than what meets the eye. It, uh, and that uh, this is a higher power that's speaking. Maybe, and, and if you think about ourselves and our beliefs and like that, sometimes we forget that maybe we can be wrong in our, in our understandings of things. And that is uh, another lesson, I think, that comes out of this, this series of plagues. That maybe we have to do a lot more introspection. And uh, I don't know. There's, there's been stuff written on that, too. This is not something that I just thought of. But it's something that is out there that is uh, in commentary here. Any other 
Any other statements or comments or questions? Well, let's see what God... Well, uh, Rabbi Miriam's well. Go ahead. Now, we are talking now, uh, look at the staff, the staff? Yes. An A <laughs> of Moshe. What's happening here? It's a very interesting thing about his staff. Dun, 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 figure it out. Okay, what, what did you want to say about the staff? Well, uh, God says to Moshe, give him the staff to Aaron, and he's going to do that. Later on, we see that this is a very private staff, and all the ways of using it is by Moshe, not by Aaron, not right. by him. So what's going on here? That's, I, I, I don't know. I never noticed that before, because the staff plays a very strong role in our trip to Canaan. And certainly to Moshe that didn't come to Canaan because of that staff, because he hit the right. rock with the staff. So it's a symbol here that might go further than what we think. So, so there is a staff and a staff with a capital S. It's not every staff. And, uh, and God has already told Moses, you will speak what I tell you, you know, and he, Moses had given up a, a tremendous fight, but, uh, you know, a, a verbal fight, but uh, uh, the staff is symbolic of, uh, of a lot of things. And as and Mary is very correct, uh, and I'm reminded also of, what happens to the staff later on when it uh, when it becomes the the basis for a flower or a group of flowers, almond flowers, and so it, it'll be an interesting it'll be an interesting device. I, oh, I got I mentioned a few things for the people. Yes, uh, Don and Ricky. I was waving at somebody outside. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay. Go ahead, Don. He wanted to play the staphylococcus. Huh? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, golly, we're digressing a bunch. But that's good. That's good. A little humor in this never hurts. Uh, any comments about the phrase, the land uh, stank? Yeah. Any comments about that phrase? Do we have to have it there? Or does it, does, is it trying to emphasize something? Can you repeat the phrase, Marty? The land, it, uh, it, uh, it, it, the, the, the frogs were piled high until, and, uh, and until the land stank. Stank. Yeah, smell. Right. Bad odor. Any comment? Is this a commentary about the land, what it had become? A stank is a pretty powerful word. Could have used smelled, but stank. It, you know, he could. Bar could, it, could it also mean barren? Uh, the the um, so the the land came un, un unuseful, unbearable, and uh, and. Unlivable. Well, it's an agricultural society. Yes, uh, uh, is that a, a oh, David? That's another windy hand. Um, <laughs> now we're talking right after the frogs and then the, the land stank, correct? Yes. Okay. Well, if we get that many frogs, that it was unbearable. Those frogs had to die. And once eventually those frogs died and they start to decompose, it could be nasty because we've had pack rats, for example, get into our attic and die up there. 
and it takes two weeks for that stench to get to to go. So if you've got a whole, frogs all over the land, yes, the land's going to stink. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but but it, it, it but it it says, it, but it's so bad that the land stank. Yeah, yes, uh, Larry. Okay, this is an altar commentary, and the yes. land stank. The stench of the putrefying dead frogs provides another link with the preceding plague in which the stench was produced by dead fish from the Nile. Right. Good point. Good point. So it's, it, it, it just is. So, so now water and land. Okay. And uh, it, it, this is going to, when you have decaying and rotting land and water, what's going to happen just from your own observations? You're going to get... Uh, what? Kenem. Decaying <laughs> animals are fertilizer. I mean, you know, so what's so yes. bad about all this? But up until that point, anybody who's put good honest fertilizer on the ground knows that it's going to have a stench for a while okay but uh it's more than that i think this is a commentary about the the land and the people that's just my own take on it that that the the uh their behavior was so bad that uh it the country reeked of its sins. Okay, I would change it in a, a poetic way for that. Anyone uh, like it, it, any other comments on that, or should we read on? Let somebody else read for a while. Anybody else? Okay, I'll be happy to read. Sure. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moshe cried unto the Lord concerning the frogs, which he had brought unto Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courts, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had spoken. Yes, I just wanted to stop at that point. Nobody mentioned uh, about it when we read this before, but uh, that um, that I have that Pharaoh became stubborn and would not heed them. Uh, it doesn't uh, repeat that it, uh, that it um, was from the hardening of his heart. Uh, Mary. Do you have the 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 Hebrew? Could you translate the yeah. Hebrew for us? Well, um, as far as I remember, there are two words about uh, Pharaoh's heart. One is kaved, and one is chazek. Kaved is heavy, and chazek is to strength, which is a very interesting difference. It's, and uh, later on, when we say belev kaved, with a heavy heart, is, uh, you know, it's like in English also, it means um, with pain. So, but kaved is also honor, honor, and also heaviness. Chazek is strengthened. I, and I don't think that this means made him stronger, but his heart is stronger not to do what God wants him to do. It's a, it's a big question and we can speculate that uh, your ideas and your commentary is as good as anyone else. Um, okay. Why Hazek? All right. So, uh... It, it, it is very interesting. By the way, at that time in world history, where was the seat of the soul? 
in the heart. No, Marty, in the kidneys. <laughs> in the kidneys. No, I'm I'm not I'm not uh, kidding. Okay. It's called Musar Clayot, which is very interesting. Uh, but you're absolutely right about the heart. The thinking comes from the heart. Everything that we do comes from the heart. They didn't have brains. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't accept that there is something as brains. But when it comes to ethical behavior, it's the kidneys. I don't kidney you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's weird to me. The heart, you're absolutely right. Everything that they decide to do comes from the heart. Yeah. Uh, think of the, uh, you know, one of the things I, I, uh, I use often is just think about the via hafta prayer. Right. Okay. Right. And you can start to say. understand where the, the thinking of the time, why, why it, 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 it's, it's so important to feel deep within. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Gail. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that made me think, Marty. When you're when you're very very sad, your heart literally does ache. Yes. It, it really does. I mean, it's yeah. a physical yeah. thing. And and they I have. Think I've just I've made a decision yeah. about the Pharaoh and his heart. I think it's like the Grinch. It was just three times too small. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. And by the way, medically speaking this is a true observation of hardening of a heart there are medical conditions that show this the phrase circumcise your heart is, is actually removing the pericardium so your heart can beat in pericarditis there is a hardening of the tissue around the heart preventing the heart from beating, from the soul, from being able to, to continue living. So it's a very important, so these are very important observations that the people of that time were making. So I just wanted to bring that into the discussion. Can we talk about a broken I, heart? I, I want yes. to correct myself, Marty. You're right about the heart, all the emotions, Emotions and thoughts, yes. because the hafta is you shall love with all your heart. You're absolutely right. What I'm saying as Musar Klayot has to do like a conscience. Yes. Your conscience is in your kidneys. So when you do something uh, unethical, that's where they go. It is... No, I'm not going to say it. Uh, uh, it. Some people would be offended by what I was going to say, so I won't say it. <laughs> You're a doctor. Doctor. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, so, anyway, any other comments about about these phrases? Well, then let's read on. Uh, uh, so now, David, if you would pick up with verse twelve. All right. And the Lord said unto Moses. Say unto Aaron, stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the earth, that it may become gnats throughout all of the land of Egypt. And they used raid and off, and all the insect repellent could not stop them. And they did so. And Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, and smote the dust of the earth. And there were gnats upon man, and upon beast, and upon all the dust of the earth, became gnats throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their secret arts to bring forth the gnats, but they could not. And there were gnats upon man and gnats upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord hath spoken. Okay. Any comments about this? Marty, yes. I, I have lice, not gnats. Now, maybe I, Mary can clear that up with a Hebrew. Is it? It's lice! 
Yes. Enum. Enum. And that is one of the things that we talk, we, when we dip our pinky into the wine, Kinem. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's you right. You know, guys, I don't know if you experienced if your kids had lice. What a nightmare is that? <laughs> I just, I, I, I'm, I'm really, truly tell you, and, and a lice doesn't discriminate men, women, rich, poor, it's just a plague. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, yes, Don. I find it kind of hilarious that the magicians could do frogs, but they couldn't do lice, and I, I'm wondering, maybe, Pharaoh said, if you double up on that again, I'm going to have your heads chopped off. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but lice, um, what is it about lice that, um, that uh, makes it so unbearable? It's the itch. The it's itching, I... constant itching. And the, the more you scratch, the more it itches. That's right. Any, any, uh, uh, Ricky, were you going to say something? Uh, they don't mention itch to me since I just came on off an allergic reaction to a okay. red, <laughs> red, 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 and red splotches and hives. And even in the middle of the night, waking up with using my toenails to scratch my legs. I mean, it's awful. Now, now in, in our modern day world, we have a medication in, a, in the form of a uh, soapy uh, mix that we, sh like a shampoo that we can use. Uh, and it's called Quell, K-W-E-L-L. -L. Now, somebody in, in, with great wisdom would understand that a, a W also is is a double v double v okay so it's a quell you just quell when this relieves all the itching <laughs> david yeah is that a wendy hand yes yeah. it is i'm going back to the lice when there was no <laughs> no shampoo um the biggest problem i don't think and i've never experienced lice thank goodness but the biggest problem is getting rid of the knife, the lice. That's where the phrase nitpicking came. You've got to do it one at a time, and it takes a long time. Talk about punishment. That's <laughs> so right. That was my point. And those nits are eggs uh, that, that are still on the hairs. And so you have to look at those very carefully okay. to remove them. And, and also, yeah. also what happens is if you get rid of your own or your own kids, then they go to school and to kinder and they come back with more. So this is a disease that really banks and bends and you cannot get really rid of it. It, it takes a long time. You have to get, get rid of a lot of linens. You don't, you don't just get rid of the linens in the beds. You burn them. That was the old way of taking care of this. You had to destroy it. It's just not throwing it out. You throw it away and <laughs> the lice can, you know, stay, lay dormant as knits. And then somebody takes the sheets and puts them on their bed and lo and behold, they get the lice. So it's Marty, a big doesn't process. That, doesn't, don't lice cause disease as well? Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yes. very serious. And that's worse than the lice. Yeah. So, so, by, so when it comes down to it, uh, it this is a, uh, a phenomenal plague. And the fact that it can be cleared up so quickly, okay, that uh, it, this is something that is um, also a miracle because it doesn't go away that quickly in real life. Yes, uh, please, Larry. Um, it's interesting, in 15... It refers to the finger of God. Yes. Now, in other times, it's the hand of God or the arm of God. Um, so anthropomorphizing, but also showing it's from God, not from Aaron or Moses. 
or maybe it's just a gesture to the pharaoh. <laughs> no, not that finger. <laughs> uh, but remember, Larry, think of Michelangelo. Yes. How the statue of creation is God finger touching the hand of human. Yes. So uh, that's interesting. I didn't recall that here it appears the finger, but in the painting it does. Yes. Very good points. I thought it was thinking of that as well. Thank you. Very good points. Thank you, David. Yes, Suzanne. Um, I also want to point out that these plagues are associated with uh, Egyptian gods. Yes. And, and, and uh, this particular one is uh, Geb, G-E-B. And he's supposed to be the god of the earth. Maybe yes. crops, perhaps, also. Um, and possibly earthquakes. Yes, uh, the, the lice was the earth god. Seb was the uh, earth god of Egypt. Right. And, and I, um, these plagues are uh, God's smackdown of the Egyptian gods. And that's something we also need to remember. That's right. Very true. Any other comments? David uh, took a break. So would anyone else like to read? Where are we at? Munch, munch. Uh, we are on... Um, 16. And the Lord said to Moses, early in the morning, present yourself to Pharaoh as he is coming out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may worship me. Okay, here it is again. I've heard that before. That's right. For if you do not let my people go, I will let loose swarms of insects um, against you and your courtiers and your people in your houses. The houses of the Egyptians and the very ground they stand on shall be filled with swarms of insects. Okay. Uh, if, if we stop at that point, Ricky, for, do you remember our discussion before about flies? Sometimes these, has anyone ever been caught in a swarm of flies? <laughs> yes, Gail. Yes, what I did have. you experience? Uh, it was near a herd of horses. Matter of fact. Okay. Any did you same experience? year? Heard okay. of horses and the flies. It, it's yeah. buzzing and it's got a a smell and it, it, it's exactly it in your mouth. It's horrible. It is. <laughs> you can actually smell the flies that way. And in addition to hearing the constant buzzing. And in and, and I mentioned the flies uh on a lake in um uh, in Africa, that the swarm can be so thick that if you're caught out on the lake when the flies are swarming, you can be suffocated. The, so, the, the flies are so close together. Mm. Okay. Yes, Gail. I have a question on verse 16. Where's Aaron? He doesn't see anything. Moses is talking directly to Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's not happened before, has it? I thought it was always Aaron doing Moses' bidding. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe Aaron, it, the, Aaron the mute. <laughs> so is this a, a moment of change in, in Moses? Because before he he was saying, "Well, I'm not." It, uh, is is this has this been a learning experience also for Moses? That he that despite his speech impediment that we made such a big fuss about, that he's able to actually speak when he's speaking the word of God, and maybe he is is developing a little courage. Is he, being, is he himself being encouraged? A leader has to be encouraged at some point. 
He can't always have Aaron as his spokesperson. He can't always have, you know, do things. He has to build up confidence that he can handle it himself or herself, as the case may be. So maybe there's a little more to this, that it's not just against Pharaoh and the, Is and the Israelites. Maybe some of the Israelites had forgotten about the power of God and the, and the previous teachings. And maybe this is a reminder to them, as opposed to the Egyptian people, as a punishment. It's just that Aaron has played such a big part in all this communication, and suddenly sure. he's not in the room or something. Excellent point, Gail. Excellent so point. He's a very mysterious person, but that's mm -hmm. another discussion. Yes, Suzanne. He needed to check his email. Yeah, I, I, I never went for that speech impediment story. I, I just think it's something that Moses made up. Just like, okay, okay. Uh, it's just like, yeah, <laughs> just like Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, and okay. uh, yeah. And I also want to point out that uh, somewhere recently I, I read that Josephus recorded that Moses had been a general in the Egyptian army. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. That's, that's interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really say in the Bible, but I think Josephus is a pretty reliable source. So, um, Anyway, so when, when we think about Moses and being a leader and having to, you know, lead all the Israelites out of Egypt and, and take them through the desert and, uh, you know, with the Ten Commandments and, and all the things that Moses had to do, I, I, it would seem to me just like Joseph had gotten uh, training through being a, a slave to becoming his rank in um, uh, in Egypt, that Moses also would have had some kind of training in his background so that he too could assume the role of leadership. And I think what we're seeing here is that he kind of, I think Moses, well, I, I think Moses was reluctant to say anything in the beginning, because one, I didn't, he, I suspect he didn't feel like the Israelites would be behind him. And two, I, you know, like we're commenting, he did not know God all that well. So I think that, you know, he needed time to build his relationship with, with God. And now we're, we're seeing the fruition of all, all that you know, coming to life. Going to, now there was a reason for stopping when we did read, if we just read the next eight, verse 18. But on that day, I will set apart the region of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of insects shall be there, that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. Any, any comments about that? So not only, uh, you know, yes, uh, uh, please, Mike. Mike yeah, I next. wanted to, I just wanted to clarify something previously. <laughs> I couldn't get in, but at the time, uh, what, what, was it, what, what the, the correct uh, expression would be Israelites or Hebrews? Which would be more it's Hebrews. Oh, Hebrews. Well, uh, you, do you know yeah. when the word Israel came about? You remember that Yaakov, Yaakov, Jacob, Yaakov had a fight, had a struggle with God, and he got a new name. And the new name was Israel. So that's why we call Israelite. And later on is about Judah, and we call Yehudim. Now, Hebrew is from the word ever, which is on the other side. So perhaps they were not on the side of Egypt 
of the Nile where Egypt is, but on the other side, ever uh, to, uh, to the Nile. So when you say Hebrew, and this is something that happens in the Torah and in the old days, and actually today too, when you find someone that is called, let's say, I don't know, that their last name is uh, Berliner, we know that it comes from Berlin. Uh, so that's something that people did, either for their profession, tailor, or for the place that they came from. Now, so Hebrews come from the place that they were, which is across the Nile. And you can call them, in my mind, what we should say is, we were living because it's we, it's not they, it's right. we. We were living in Egypt. We were living in here. We were walking in the desert because it's we. So uh, that's the, the about the name. Uh, either one will uh, work. Thank you. Uh, Larry had his hand up and then Chris. Um, Paul has a commentary on 18, but I shall sell up, set apart on that day the land of Goshen. Goshen is the region of northeastern Egypt that, according to the account in Genesis 4634, was set aside for Hebrew settlement. This is the first clear, clear indication in Exodus that the Hebrews lived in a segregated area in Egypt. That geographical segregation will play a crucial role in the climactic ninth and 10th play. Very Thank good. you, Larry. Thank you. Yes, Chris. Chris, you're, you're muted. Please, we cannot hear you. You're still muted. Okay, now I'm. Here you go. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Miri, I have a question for you. Do you, uh, do you remember, or am I wrong saying that when Abraham uh, left the land of Ur, where his father was making idols and all of that, wasn't that that God told him go to the other side? like you said, and they became Hebrews, um, or no? No, he said, go, 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 and I am going to show you the way. Okay. It doesn't tell him where is he going, and that's the beauty of that statement. You just follow God. You don't, you right. don't know right. the direction. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. This discussion led me to think there's a phrase in uh, dis discussing Abraham. Okay. Uh, where, uh, and, and somebody please help me with this because uh, Ha'ibri is used in discussing Abraham. Mm hmm. And wait, I'll check it out. Please do. It, it just crossed my mind, and I, I'd have to look it up. Yeah. If, so, so, ah, here she comes. Okay. Just to, just to, while she's doing that, uh, if we just read verse um, uh, uh, 19. And I will make a distinction between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall come to pass. Okay. So God is saying there is, you know, now it's time to separate this out. And, um, and I want the, uh, uh, I, I'm still going to call them Israelites. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> separate them out from the um from the uh egyptians yes don 
Well, Goshen is in uh, northeastern Egypt, but a uh, few hundred miles upriver is a in the middle of the Nile. There's an island called Elephantine Island, in which there is a gigantic Jewish temple, um, and um, I don't know if that was ever populated or whether that was in existence at this time, um, but it was. I don't know. But it's it's still there. I mean, the, the ruins are still there, and so so uh, mystery. What's how, what's how the name happened. of the place, Don? Or Don? What's the name oh, of the place? Elephantine Island. It's a big island right in the middle of the Nile. It's about maybe three hundred miles up river south of um, the Delta. Actually, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, it, it's it, now it uh, in my mind while you were speaking, they said that Elephantine Island. You you, you mentioned that it was. I, I, the way you described it was in the Delta, the Nile Delta region, but it's it's further up the river in what is now called today Aswan. Oh. Yeah, so 300 miles south upstream of the river. Yes. Oh. Which I find interesting. Yeah, I see seven uh, Jewish presence, uh, 7th century BCE. Mm hmm so it, so I, I now I don't know if it's still there after the uh, Aswan Dam was constructed. Is it still there? Yeah, there's still a there's uh, rooms of the temple. I mean, it was a, a big structure. Fascinating. So it was a really strong, strong. Uh, uh, Hebrew presence. Yeah, what it's done, what I'm reading on uh, Wikipedia is that after the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in the sixth century, uh, some Jews, refugees, went south and settled there on that island. So that gives you a little history. Okay. I, I realize that. I'm not sure if, if, that, if it was um, built up at that time or it was there for centuries before um, i don't know no right. yeah. don't know but that's an interesting finding um that's another thing about the uh migration of the jews uh, in the diaspora uh some people uh uh, uh have suggested that the messiah in uh, Africa that go into that area. The, the, the Maasai used to migrate through Sudan and all of those areas. And uh, some of their culture uh, is very similar to uh, Jewish tradition. Oh. And there are other tribes too. Uh, the, uh, in the... Um... <sighs> It, it's further on the east coast, further down the, the uh, east coast of Africa. There's another large tribe that that is is also genetically has been genetically shown to have uh, some tie with uh, Jewish heritage. So it's, it's it is an interesting comment. Thank you, Don, for bringing that up. Any uh, Miri is still still. Checking yeah, this. I'm going to another book. <laughs> okay, you take your time. Uh, Marty, could have been Ethiopia, the one you were thinking about? No. Yes, Ethiopia. The it, it's further south. It's further it, south. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, it's. I, I want. Okay, the. Um, I'll look it up. 
it's further south uh, and, and along the the um, the coastal areas uh, and like that. But uh, yeah, Jewish trade routes uh, all the way through the time of Solomon go all the way across to Asia, uh, which is very interesting. But that's another story for another time. Uh, so if, uh, Ricky, would you please read verse 20? And the Lord did so. Heavy swarms of insects invaded Pharaoh's palace and the houses of the stretchways throughout the country of Egypt. The land was ruined because of the swarms of insects. Okay, now, now if these are flies, uh, the Egyptian god, uh, oh God, I, I can hardly read this. Uachit, or, or I, I think that's what it is. It's one of the god fly of Egypt. Oh. Uh, and uh, yeah, Marty, I have Amun Ra for. Okay, uh, that's okay. There are different, uh, depending on who you read, they will have all different. Uh, uh, gods uh, assigned to these. So that's okay. But that's good, Amun Ra. So, um, any other comments? Okay. Uh, Marty, I'm going to continue checking it and I'm going to send you a message. Okay. Because I cannot see when it you now. find it. Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll look that up in another resource. Uh, uh, and, and see if I can come up with that again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments to this point? Yes, Chris. Chris, you're muted. Yeah. Is the question that they are flies or that they are locusts? Well, no, no, not locusts, flies. but it, okay. it's, uh, it, insects. insects. In some interpretation it, words, they use the word insect and some flies. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Mike, did you have a hand up? Okay. And I know Ricky's hand is sewing, so that's why that's up. <laughs> and, and okay, so let's go on with verse 21. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, go and sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses replied, I would not be right to do this for what we sacrifice to the Lord our God is untouchable to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice that which is untouchable to the Egyptians before their very eyes, they will not stone us. So well, no, we it, it's will they not stone us? Will they not stone us? Sorry. Right. It would have been a question mark then. Right. An exclamation point. Um, okay. Will they not stone us? So we must go a distance of three days into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he may command us. Okay, Let any, any discussion at this point? So here it is again, the same uh, thing. The same thing. Uh, Marty? Yes. In uh, what I found, I don't have exactly the, um, the um, chapter, but I'll find it out. But you were absolutely right to say Avram, Ivri, Ivri Hebrew, absolutely. So I'm going to look for that. Now, okay. if you're going to say, well, the, the connection, you know, there is no beginning or end in the right. Torah. So, okay, good point. Good point. Thank you, Rabbi. Any other comments? Okay. So, um, so the theme is again being repeated, and it, it is has Moses has uh, uh, the Pharaoh, uh, you know, what what is the Pharaoh doing here? He's putting conditions on right. how far they can go, on why they should do again having some kind of control of whatever they have to do or want to do. And um, the, the beauty that I see here is that uh, they got a good way to say, no, we have to go 
whatever God told us. And the, I don't know if it's excuse or it's really the truth that whatever we're going to sacrifice is not allowable for the, the Egyptians. So they will hurt us or they will kill us if they see us do this. But that was a really good idea that somebody, maybe God, come up with so that the Pharaoh will see whether there's a problem in there. So, yes, you do have to go further. Of course, you're not going, but you do have to go further. But I like that. I like that um, they come up with a very good excuse because I'm assuming they're talking about bulls or cows or beef or some, some sort of that. Uh, animals which they are holy to to the Egyptians and so but I don't know if that's what yeah. you know it, it, it's a good Moses point. was gonna do mm -hmm. because first the request is to go three days mm -hmm. okay and so uh, uh, and and Moses is explaining all of this Remember, Moses is speaking, uh, uh, the words of God are coming out through Moses. Right. And so uh, the, the Pharaoh says in response, well, let me tell you something, uh, because I still haven't forgotten what I said before all of this started. Right. Uh, I'm worried that if you go too far, you will leave. You have to go. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to say now, I'll let you go sacrifice. I'm bargaining with you now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and sacrifice to your God in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. But don't go very far. Okay. A day and a half, maybe. <laughs> That's right. Will the, and then he says, plead on my behalf. Right. <laughs> and so Moses is going to say... Uh, in response, when I leave your presence, I will plead with the Lord that the swarms of insects depart tomorrow right. from Pharaoh and his courtiers and his people. But let not Pharaoh again act deceitfully. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Moses and God are recognizing this whole concept that that the pharaoh is not being totally honest with his with his uh actions here and uh, uh, uh and so uh it's to finish that line uh, martin yes martin what i think it's very interesting is that pharaoh knows and moshe asked to sacrifice not where they live but Far away. Far not, away. Not, not in Egypt. In Egypt. They have to go to the desert to sacrifice. What's that about? Well, what has preceded? What has happened to the land? Oh, it's destroyed by the it's, swarm, by the right. it, rise, it, by the frost. It, it's so corrupted. It, it has been it's corrupted. Uh -huh. That's another way of looking at it. Sure. Yeah, yes, Don. I want to skip over my theme about Pharaoh not being able to help himself, but but they, the Hebrews <laughs> to go out into the desert and um, sacrifice. I mean, God at that time anyway demanded burnt offering. That was that was sacrifice. So the Hebrews are slaves. Um, they're no longer pastoral people. They don't have herds with them. They they make bricks for Pharaoh. So I'm just wondering how they're going to, is it what, hundreds of thousands of Hebrews and somehow they're going to go out into the desert and find animals to do blood sacrifices with. I'm just... God will provide. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said it. <laughs> <laughs> he did it once before. <laughs> Safeway, right on the edge of town. They can... Does it always have to be uh, meat? Does it always oh, have to be a, a beast? They also bring oil. Maybe wait, 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 wait. Uh, uh, so <laughs> do it one at a time, no, please. There used to be also bread and oil 
right. and a bird, depending on what you had at home. No, that's <laughs> right. No, if you if you could afford the meat, it was meat. Right. Exactly. And then if you didn't have that, exactly. you had birds. And if you didn't have that, you had, but that comes later in the discussion. Yeah. So yeah. But we know from right. people and, and right. Cain, Cain and Abel's story. Yeah. Okay. The sacrifice. Right. Okay. The different sacrifices. But, but God preferred, to, God was down yes. on Abel's sacrifice. You know, he wanted he wanted the meat. He was and a good so he, Hey, uh, well, th th this brings place. us back. Th this now digresses into a story of Babel, mm -hmm. the city of Babel. Yeah. And, you know, well, that man wanting meat to be right. more like God. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so at this stage, the, they're all very poor and they are going to be able to sacrifice the, the 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 they were vegetarians at this time and you know in general and they are going to have the uh the wheat the barley whatever they could find they were going to have that later on the the meat issue comes into the story much but in a much greater fashion more vivid fashion I just want to share with you, since we mentioned that if they didn't have a cow or sheep or kid yeah. or whatever, they would come with a bird. And the bird mm -hmm. is really tiny. So not to embarrass the person that brings the bird, the sacrifice is with the feathers. You don't remove the feathers of the bird because then it becomes teeny tiny. So the rabbis, uh, or whoever was there, they, it, this is a rabbinical story. You do it with the feathers. What I want to bring up is the fact that the law says that only the high priest and only in the tent of meeting and in the temple is the place for sacrificing. So, okay. and as yeah. I said, you know, it doesn't matter, no. uh, but, but let's remember that. And they had that with Aaron. So there was this, a comes, on this will come up. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Gail. I, I don't believe there's, there's no commandment anywhere that says you must eat meat. Nowhere is that. That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> I agree with you. But you are very correct. But the Levites had to eat something. So they ate the meat of the sacrifice. Right, but that's so they there's didn't no have waste. Crop. Right, that's so they there's didn't no waste. waste. And, yeah. yeah, and we're talking about a time that um, agriculture didn't exist because they were moving. So what would they eat? Well. Tofu. <laughs> or could they still sacrifice? Sheep. I second that. Tofu is good. <laughs> <laughs> they could still sacrifice sheep. Mm. Mm. Uh, what does, again, going back to Abraham. Okay. So that you can still sacrifice sheep for the purpose of, uh, for God. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Chris, you had your hand up. Yeah, I'm not thinking that when they left, they took cattle with them. They took their yes, animals and all their possessions. Right. So they did have something to sacrifice. One of the animals they were carrying, definitely, they were, they were the Hebrews' animals. There were no Egyptians' uh, bulls. So they, they got it covered. Okay. Any Ooh. other comments? This is good. You guys are doing a good job. Any other comments? They ate mana. They ate yeah, that, mana. That... And mana Gale and Chris could taste any way you wanted. Mm -hmm. So right. if you want to be a vegan, you eat the mana and the mana taste of vegan. And, uh, Definitely vegan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. So, uh, so again, Pharaoh is... Um, uh, being chastised this time by Moses, okay, 
But let not Pharaoh again act decisively, not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And so, uh, 20, if, uh, Ricky, I think well, I, we have to stop here. Okay. At, okay, we'll stop here. And so we'll start next time at, with verse uh, 26.